Chapter 2 Before the Diary Could I ever forget my first week in Elizabethville? It was 1938. I had arrived by way of Brussels in an Italian-made Savoia Marchetti plane of Sabina Airlines. The journey had lasted an exhausting four days. I can still hear the propellers throb in my temples. Flying over the Sahara then and landing at those tiny outposts that string the African route? What a feat! Some of the settlements consisted of a corrugated iron barracks and a few scattered huts, as if to justify the existence of an airstrip. It was like being on another galaxy. I was filled with awe and fascination at once, and pondered if having left Baltimore hadn't been an act of madness. Elizabethville was a pleasant surprise. The town looked neat with its veranda-fronted homes and its tree-lined avenues. Flamboyance, Jacarandas, and purple bougainvillea. What amazed me most, though, was the climate. July here is the dry season, and the temperature is delightful. In the evenings, you have to wear a woolen jersey. The sun rises quite early, and the shrubs are covered with dew. I found the Belgians somewhat more hospitable and relaxed than in their mother country. There seemed to be a strong sense of solidarity among whites here. They accepted me immediately in spite of the fact that I was a foreigner. I had already been invited out several times by people I had just met. During a whole month, I stayed at what is known here as a residential guest house. Though far from luxurious, my room was pleasant and well kept. There was no private bathtub or WC. You had to go to the annex for it. But I had a wash basin with hot, cold running water. I had been warned not to drink the water unless it was boiled and filtered first, if I didn't want to catch dysentery or bilharzia. A Congolese boy named Chikapa was at my disposal literally from sunup to sundown. He would knock at my door almost at the crack of dawn, and whether I liked it or not, I had to get up. The first key Swahili words I learned were Kongoju Kidogo, wait a bit, and Salamu, greetings in that order, where Chikapa would rush in, armed with fly talks in the one hand, he held it at gunpoint, and a canister of floor wax in the other. As soon as the bed was done, I would head for the terrace dining room, to protect my lungs from the potent stuff from which Chikapa sprayed every inch of my living quarters, thinking perhaps that in this manner he would rid me of the unfavorable spirits that roam around every newly come pale face. Breakfast would then be served. It consisted of coffee and milk and a mound of thickly buttered tartines. The Belgians have a healthy appetite indeed. I would stare at them in wonderment as they'd wolf down the entire plate of sandwiches. After having chewed a tartin au fromage and drunk my mug of café au lait, I would usually go out for a long, invigorating walk, thus preparing myself for the pungent odor that awaited me in my room. Whether natural or not, The smells and sounds in Africa have a physicality of their own. I felt this to be even truer as we approached the hot rainy season. The dust particles clinging to your skin, the air filled with electricity, and clusters of dragonflies performing death dances around naked bulbs. Then, after the storm, the earth, like a sated monster, belches out its vegetal exhalations. Nature turns into a huge Turkish bath in which the bathers are the trees and the underbrush. It is their sweat that tickles your nostrils and moistens your flesh, so you cannot but partake in the orgy of scents permeating the whole atmosphere. Every leaf, twig, petal becomes an ear unto itself, reverberating the echoes of a teeming and invisible world. The chirping of crickets, the croaking of toads, reach you in a dramatic variety of staccatos, as if you were auditioning a private orchestra whose conductor, too, remained imaginary. When flashes of lightning whip the ashen sky, renting the air, you are jolted to your very marrow, and the sight of a jacaranda crashing across the street is an agonizing one. You hear its demise in clear, distinct stages, the uprooting, the creaking lament inside the trunk, and the final swooshing thud. I still have mixed feelings about the war years I spent in the Belgian Congo. Had I not heeded John Maxwell's exhortations, I would most probably have been conscripted into the U.S. Army, serving on the European front or maybe in the Pacific. 
Dear, dear John, he's resting in the American cemetery near Bayou, Normandy, while I... No, he was right, and I oughtn't to lament over my present fate. Nevertheless, what a sheltered life we enjoyed in the Congo during those five obsessive years. The battle was raging thousands of kilometers from here. Every Belgian, every white person had a relative, a friend engaged in it. The subject would be on everybody's tongue day after day. The defeats, the personal tragedies. But there was something unreal about it all. It was as if we were listening to the same horror tale each evening, told over and over again with sometimes a different slant. Letters from the mother country would be read out loud with a pinch of sorrow and nostalgia. We were short of luxury goods and of those items which made life in the colony less dreary, but we had no right to complain. There were times when I felt guilty that I couldn't contribute directly to the war efforts, especially when the South African and British troops from Rhodesia would pass through Elizabethville on their way to North Africa. That I had accepted the partnership with Paul Danola, he owned the guest house where I had stayed initially, was a redeeming factor. All our rooms were reserved for military personnel, and as an American, I could make myself useful since not many Belgians knew sufficient English to settle the more urgent matters. Seeing all those young soldiers and airmen leaving a comfortable life behind them to help the Allied forces filled me with remorse. More than once the thought occurred to me that I should follow their example and enlist as a volunteer or even return to the States. But courage failed me, reckoning that I did go out of my way to act as an interpreter between the British officers and the local authorities and often stayed with them late at night when my presence was needed. They seemed to appreciate my services, yet I couldn't refrain from considering myself a coward of sorts, even if I did contribute more than most whites who lived here. Such comparisons are poor justification for one's weaknesses. Not that I condemned or judged the attitude of my peers. It was a struggle within myself. Having left America in the first place may be part of this struggle. In Baltimore, I used to dream of freedom and open spaces. How ironic that I should land in a colony where millions of people were subservient to a handful of civilisators. Yet, it proved to be more salutary than the terror in which my father had kept me. Ever since I can remember, when I disobeyed him, he would repeatedly accuse me of having murdered our darling Susan. Mother died in childbirth, and her husband wouldn't let an occasion pass to remind me who was the cause of it. He had vowed to make a man of me or break my bones. He seldom hit me. He didn't need to. The tremor of his voice alone had the effect of an earthquake. Father never remarried, though he did have mistresses. But he was too loyal to the memory of our darling Susan to make any allusions to them. I learned it through rumors quite late when I myself reached the age of puberty. Once a week he would spend the night out. This would never be discussed, and he wouldn't supply any pretext either. It was part of life, and that was it. The most implacable trait in Father was how unswervingly he would stick to his principles. His honesty toward himself had an inhuman quality. I wonder how our darling Susan, indeed how any woman, could have stood such a rigid and uncompromising personality. Yes, there was one, Clara, the apple of his eye. She looked so much like mother. Although she was only two years my senior, people took us for twins. In his rare moments of effusiveness, father would stare at her while we would be dining and say abstractedly, with a faint smile, those full lips, those sad oval eyes, and that snub nose, one would swear you were Susan's baby sister. Clara would then give me a quick glance as if to excuse herself. Undeniable as it was, Father wouldn't see my resemblance to Susan or to Clara. He remained blind to it. I had sent his beloved wife to the realm of the dead. How then could I have anything in common with her? It was visceral, and this feeling made me a non-person before his bespectacled eyes. He had long ago decided that I would never grow up to be a man. I was too sissy. But Clara always stood by me, and, in a strange way, he would respect her for it. Then there were the harrowing years of boarding school, so that I would toughen up. Obviously, it had the opposite effect. Upon entering college and having consulted Clara, 
I decided to tell father about my tendencies. I had been frequenting John Maxwell for a year now. Clara could plead in my favor with all the tears of her body, but this time father stood adamant. He simply and squarely disavowed me, and I have never seen him since. Clara maintained the family link by paying me regular visits. Because of her, I made painstaking efforts to rationalize his behavior. But as my inclinations became more apparent, so did my allergy to father's cynicism. Just mentioning his name chilled my spine. John Maxwell had harbored a dream unbeknownst to everyone except me. He wished to spend his life as a missionary in Central Africa. He was fascinated by Livingstone and Albert Schweitzer, but in spite of his vocation, he had deemed he wasn't fit to tackle such a formidable task. How we would talk about that distant continent, relishing the consonants of names we believe would remain locked in our imagination. Lake Tanganyika, Zanzibar, Stanleyville, Victoria Falls. Until the day John came forth with a most extravagant idea. You want to quit college, don't you? I still have two years to go. Why don't you go settle in the Belgian Congo? I'll join you after graduation. You will have time to get acclimatized and decide whether you will wish to stay on. It was a shock, yet the thought gradually crystallized into what was to become a lifelong adventure. I was virtually penniless, but John, who had a personal fortune, put several thousand dollars at my disposal. Thanks to his generosity, I could make the trip to Africa and later open my own boutique in Elizabethville. John decided to stay another year at the seminary where he was preparing his vocational métier. But by the time he had finished, America had entered World War II and he was called to serve under the colors. (laughs) 